Cool. Good morning. First talk of the day. Um, this is a title slide my company would want me to use. Um, this is the one that I would really want to use. Um, I noticed when I was preparing this talk and talking to some people about it that there is some kind of an age gap. It's like people under 35, they don't actively remember Celebrity Dead Watch, uh, that match, and people who are like my age and older, they do. Um, so I figured for the younger people in the room that I ex explain a little bit. Like, there's this TV channel called Music Television. Now it shows mostly reality shows um, and like dating, dating programs. Um, but it used to be about music because we did not have the bandwidth to actually watch videos in the 90s. I mean, YouTube didn't exist. Um, downloading a song took an entire evening over, over dial-up. So if we wanted to see the music clips, we had to watch television. And we fell in love with some artists at that time. And then MTV started to, thinking, started to think about what can we do differently. And that's when it all started going downhill. So Celebrity Deathmatch is part of that. And we first got Beavs and Butthead. You might remember those. Um, and there was also Celebrity Deathmatch. So what was Celebrity Deathmatch? Um, I was thinking about what am I going to name this talk. I'm going to be talking about actors versus actors. And I was thinking Celebrity Deathmatch is an animated series with clay figures where celebrities fight celebrities. So you often have actors fighting actors, right? And it was really cool because they even had these clay figure commentators. Uh, I think they were called Nick Diamond and, and um, I have it written down somewhere, Johnny Gomez. Um, there was also Mills Lane who was the referee. Um, he had catchphrases like, let's get it on. And whenever something sketchy happened, he's like, I'll allow it, right? And I remember like some of the episodes very vividly, like Tobey Maguire against Jay Gyllenhaal or Paris Hilton about, uh, against Nicole Richie. Actually, MTV posted all of these on YouTube. So if, if you're not familiar, go and watch it. It's very gory. Um, I, I left out all the gore, uh, but it gets very bloody really quickly. All I'm trying to say is, I watched MTV when they were still cool. I had to invert this meme because MTV no longer is cool. Um, but yeah, it works. So having that out of the way, um, let's get down to the order of the day. Um, what am I going to talk about today? I'm first going to tell you why you would want to use an actor framework, right? Um, try to keep that brief. And I'll give you a little bit of a history of how we got to the point where we are today. Um, and I'm going to show you some shared concepts between Akka and Orleans, stuff that is similar between the two. And then we will basically fight it out, and I'll show you some of the differences between the two. Um, and hopefully by 10 o'clock, uh, we will come to a conclusion, and you can go and have a coffee. So why would you want to use actors? What has changed in our industry? Now, first of all, we are not writing software at the same scale anymore as 20 years ago. We've had an explosion of the internet. People are using smart devices, not just smartphones and watches, but like you probably have a bunch of connected devices in your house as well. And a lot of the stuff that we do has to be prepared for a much bigger scale. Let's say that you write a backend for an app if you're really planning to scale that to millions of users, you're going to need a system that is able to keep up with that, right? And we're no longer running on specialized hardware anymore. Um, a lot of us, when we do high-scale stuff, we are deploying it to the cloud. And the cloud is basically a whole bunch of commodity hardware. So we're going to need to figure out a way to scale with commodity hardware to numbers that we were previously not able to imagine. And if we look at 50 years of evolution in microprocessors, um, there's a couple of trends that you could notice. I mean, three to five gigahertz CPUs, that has been the norm for the last decade and a half or so. Um, so that has stabilized completely. Uh, what we also see is the single thread performance, it's tapering off, it's still increasing. Um, there's a lot of branch prediction stuff that is making sure that this is still advancing, but it's not advancing as much as the potential number of users for our systems. 
So we need to look for a little bit of hope. And the only hope that we have is this. When I started college, um, I got like the best of the best. It was a Pentium 3. Uh, single core machine, right? It had 128 megabytes of RAM. Um, that was like a, a high-end spec PC at that time. Now we all have probably eight cores in, in our pocket, right? And modern laptops, like, like my new one, it has 14 cores in, um, in a simple laptop that I can carry around. Now, to be able to use multiple cores, we're going to need to use multiple threads. And if we need to use multiple threads, that's when stuff gets hard. Because if we look at Amdahl's law, he's a very smart gentleman who thought about this uh, way more than we did. And he describes how much you can theoretically speed up a workload by throwing more resources at it. So if you add more CPUs, you're always going to be limited by the amount of your code that can be executed in parallel. If you can execute, execute all of your code in parallel, you can basically scale to infinity. But that is not the reality. If we have multiple threads, we're always going to be faced with state. And at some point, more of our threads are going to be accessing the same state. And then you get race conditions. And when you get race conditions, you need to introduce some kind of blocking, right? You need to make sure that that resource is only, be, is only used by one thread at a time. That opens you to the possibility of, of deadlocks, um, which is not fun at all. But assuming that you can solve that, what you will have with shared state is that you will have a bit of your code that cannot run in parallel. All the access to this resource needs to run in series and not in parallel, which is going to hurt our potential scaling as per Amdahl's law. So, and assuming you can do that, anybody here tried to manage their own thread pool at some point in their careers? Was it fun? No. I mean, assuming that you, you can get the deadlocks and, and the serializing out of the way, scheduling threads is hard. I mean, if you have to do it by yourself, I prefer somebody smarter than me thinking about that problem. And that is where all of these actor frameworks come in. And we have a lot of them now. I mean, a lot more than you might realize. There are actor-focused languages like Erlang and Elixir. We have frameworks on the .NET CLR. You can do actors in Dapper or Orleans, Aka.NET, Proto-Actor on the JVM. There's a whole, I mean, the list of, of actor frameworks on Wikipedia is, is literally like two screens long. Now, what these frameworks promise us is you will write your code in a very simple way. Because inside your actor, everything is going to be single-threaded. So that's easy to reason about. But they promise you that if you have a lot of actors, you can get a very high degree of parallelization, which makes your scale-out a lot easier and almost linear. And by keeping a lot of your state in memory, you can also go to very, very low latency situations. And I'm sorry, but that is my company mandated um, lock screen that apparently I cannot turn off. I have to use the right finger. Um, and you can use these systems to be extremely resilient as well. I mean, there's resiliency built in so that you can recover from exceptions. Now, we have a lot of them. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit more about how we got to the point uh, of these two frameworks coming to be, right? Now, a lot of the initial research comes from the 1970s, and it was all theoretical. They did not have the hardware to do a lot of the stuff that they were thinking about. But Carl Hewitt, he was basically um, reasoning about um, how he could structure code for artificial intel intelligence in sort of neural network. They didn't use the term, but it, it was something like that. And that's what was actors are all based on. This happened in 1973. This is not new. It has been around for a long time. And what he was reasoning about is how can we use many independent processors to process bigger workloads? And those models got refined by a whole bunch of computer scientists and mathematicians over the following decades until in the 80s, Ericsson came up with a language called Erlang. 
Um, they, in Ericsson research, like people my age may, may remember, it's the same time we had Ericsson smartphones around celebrity death match time, right? Um, not smartphones, dumb phones. Um, but they designed the language to be extremely fault tolerant because when they were designing these telco systems, uptime was the way that they made money. Every minute that you're down, you cannot charge customers for phone calls. So they were doing this research. Um, Joe Armstrong was one of the people who worked on that a lot. And they wanted to be able to have multiple telco systems work together to be very, very resilient. And that got applied in the 1990s to build the AX AXD 301. It has been their flagship um, telco system for more than a decade. It's a total of two million lines of code, about half of which is Erlang. There's also some C and C++ in there. Um, and they manage with these systems to get nine nines of uptime. If you want to put that into perspective, that is 31 milliseconds of downtime per year, right? I cannot get that. With anything I ever wrote, never. But just to show that there is really a lot of benefit in the resiliency of these systems. And then it was a little bit quiet, like a lot of the mainstream software development was happening in object-oriented languages and, 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 and uh, procedural languages, and these actor models, they, they lived their own life on the side. But then because of this explosion of, of the internet that I was telling you about, like the need picked up, because we need to be able to process stuff, stuff in parallel, and that is what these frameworks are really good at. So in the Microsoft Extreme Computing Group, people were researching how they could leverage their data centers, now known as Azure, um, their big data centers that they had for Office and for Exchange Online and for um, Xbox Live, um, how they could leverage that and all those commodity servers to, to process big workloads. And when the time came to actually uh, release Halo 4, this is what they used. And the approach that Orleans takes to an actor model is a bit opinionated and they abstract some uh, stuff around, um, away from it. But what you will see is that they take, some, they take some steps to make it easier for the developer, but what they did works really well, especially if you pair it with cloud, more specifically Azure. Because they wanted to build something that's extremely high available and with almost linear scaling. And for Halo 4, that was really important because they usually release games around the holidays um, and then a lot of people are going to be playing over the Christmas holiday, but your staff is going to be on holiday as well. So if you have problems, I mean, that's not going to solve itself. Um, so they used this to be able to scale it out almost linearly and Halo 4 was a success, so it all worked. Around the same time, um, two people started porting um, Akka, which is a framework built by Lightbend on the JVM. And they started porting that to .NET because they had a need for an actor system um, that worked on .NET. And they learned about each other's efforts. Um, Aaron and Roger, they learned about each other. Um, Aaron started a company called Petabridge. And this has been growing ever since. I mean, they increase performance every time that they do a new release. Um, it's definitely production stable, um, and it is very, very, very performant. Now, they got permission from Lightband to call it Akka.net because the Akka name comes from the JVM. Um, and they are some of the .NET actor systems. There's, there's others out there, um, but they are two of the more popular ones. Now, before we dive into the differences, I would like to say that um, a lot of the things that these frameworks do under the hood are basically very, very, very similar. There is a lot more that is similar between these two frameworks than what actually separates them, right? Now, the whole idea is that an actor or a grain, they have different names for that, um, or Lean's calls it a grain, and Akka.net calls it an actor, the reason they call it a grain is um, they speak about a virtual actor model or a virtual actor system. Um, so they used some different names, but it's basically the same thing. What you will have is you will have an object instance um, that has its own behavior. 
and all of the state is going to be internal to this object. So you're going to have private fields um, in your object that are actually um, portraying all the state that is supposed to be in this actor. And everything that modifies that state or all the stuff that needs to respond to things that are going to happen to this actor, that is just code, functions, as you're used to writing them. And the input is where it gets really interesting. The only way you can actually talk to an actor is by sending it a message. And those messages get processed one by one in order. Um, and this is important because, because they are executed one by one in order, you know that there is always only a single thread that is going to be running on your actor at any given time. And that makes the whole parallelizable part really easy to reason about because you don't have to worry about locking when you're processing a message inside an actor. This guaranteed single thread threadingness is what is going to enable our almost linear scaling. Now these messages, um, what you will see is these are pretty simple CLR objects, um, but they do get passed around a network from time to time. So they get serialized and deserialized um, as these systems operate. Um, Aka and Orleans have slightly different approaches to that. Uh, Orleans more often than ACA serializes and deserializes uh, messages. Um, but this, this is something you have to keep in mind. So you might as well design them for immutability. It's gonna make your life so much easier. And then the big thing that ties all of this together. As I said, I like smart people thinking about this stuff for me so that I don't have to. Um, and the thing that ties it all together is the actor system or the silo, right? Orleans calls it a silo, uh, Aka.net calls it an actor system, but they basically do the same thing. It's the orchestrator that ties it all together. And the first thing that it does is it manages the life cycles of your actors. You are never um, instantiating an actor yourself. You tell the actor system to do it for you, and they spin it up, and they can take it down, they can rehydrate it when you need it again, stuff like this. And this is managed um, by the silo or the actor system. Also, it takes care of all the messaging and the addressing. If you send a message to a certain address, the actor system will make sure that it arrives in the inbox of the particular actor. And it does then, from those inboxes, do all the thread scheduling for us. And the thread scheduling is the stuff that I told you earlier that I don't like doing. It's the hard part, and they do that for us in this system. There's also a way to set timers in both actor systems. It, it, it works a little bit differently in each, but you can send timed messages to actors. Um, so if you would have to build your own uh, scheduler or whatever, like you could do, easily do it with actors as well. Um, and there's also a, a publish subscribe event bus in, inside the actor system. Now this is what ties it all together. But now we're talking about one node in our cluster. All these actor systems are going to uh, work together in a cluster. And this is where the scaling really happens. Um, if we let them work together, we are able to shard our actor across all the nodes. And if we can shard our actors, actors across a bigger cluster, that allows us to add more nodes and that way we can enable that scaling. And when a node drops from the cluster, you can recreate the actors on another node so that they can take over. Um, all of that can happen seamlessly. Um, so you're also adding resilience to your cluster in this way. Um, this near linear scale out, it's actually pretty amazing. If you see the scaling graphs um, of what they did with Halo, like adding 500 servers, in classical scenarios, you're actually running into limits with things like load balancers and so on. Um, but with that, they could nearly linearly add nodes to their Halo cluster, and that worked extremely well. So now we're going to do the thing that separates them. What is different in these two uh, frameworks? And I want to say I'm opinionated. So I'm going to let you guys be the judge of this, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and explain a difference between the two frameworks. 
And then you guys will be able to, this QR code will return on every voting slide as well. You can vote which framework you liked better, right? Um, so the first thing that we need to look at is like what, what kind of API do we need to develop our actors when we're doing our active development um, in our day-to-day -day job. Um, and what we will see um, when we start in Akka.net, creating an actor, uh, what we do is we inherit from the receive actor or any of the other actor-based classes that there are. Um, and that basically enables us to um, spin this up as an actor in our actor system. And when we, uh, there is a possibility to pass constructor parameters through a system called props. We will see that in a couple of uh, slides. Um, we can pass parameter constructors, uh, parameter um, arguments. We can add constructor parameters to this, uh, to this actor uh, the way that you're used to. And if we want to handle specific messages, we need to have some kind of handler for it. And as you can see, if I want to respond to the uh, complete round message, um, it's going to call the handle, uh, handle complete round method below, right? Which is um, easy to notice. We can use any .NET class or struct as a message, as long as it's serializable and deserializable. You don't need to add any attributes to it. Aka.NET takes care of all of that um, by itself. So that works really well. Um, it's, um, if you write your code in that handler method, the thing is this is asynchronous by default. So what this does on the Aka.NET actor is it takes in the message, it comes from the inbox, but it's not giving any response. The thread on the sender has already um, exited. And if we want to send something back, we can use properties like sender.tell and that goes to the inbox of the sender actor. Right? And that's how you can actually respond to a message. Now there's a lot more to it than that, but I think this is the basics. Like we inherit from that receive actor, we register some handlers, we can respond to messages, send something back if we want. Now in Orleans there, it works a little bit differently. Um, we start by creating an interface that has to um, implement or inherit from one of the base uh, interfaces that are in the Orleans uh, packages. So this is one with um, a GUID as its key. Um, and then what we will do is we will basically make asynchronous methods as members of our interface. We can define our own in the way that we want to write them. And I specifically named these parameters content and not message because Orleans will wrap the parameters that you put in this function. You could have seven parameters and it will wrap all of that into a message for you, okay? So these are not the actual messages. They are the parameters to, and, and the, the return types of your methods um, and Orleans will wrap that for you. Now, after you've made that interface, you're going to um, inherit from one of the grain-based classes um, and implement your interface and that is basically all you need to do. Um, I'm sure you've written a sync code before if, you do, if you've done anything with .NET. Um, so you can do whatever you, you want to do. Now, Orleans uses more specific serializers. So if you want to use anything that is not one of the .NET um, based data types, you're gonna need to add this generate serializer attribute to it for it to work with the Orleans uh, message serializers. It's not a big deal, but it's something you have to think about. And your code goes there, but the cool thing here is, um, in Orleans, as opposed to Akka, the caller will actually have a thread waiting, and it's gonna wait for the response to come back. So you can use a normal method return to answer the caller of your message. So if you use an empty task, that's going to do nothing, but if you could send data back in the way that you're used to in other um, .NET programs, right? So we have to figure out. It's your time to vote. What coding style did you like better? 
the ACA.NET one, where the messages are really explicit, where you can register handlers, where the tell is one way and the responses are uh, on another thread and another inbox? Or did you like the Orleans one better that is a lot closer to the normal C Sharp that we're writing in OO systems, um, where we can actually just have um, task-based methods to uh, return? Okay, you like ACA.NET better. Good, I'm gonna put it down as one point for ACA. Um, cool, second round in our fight. Um, once we've coded our actors, we're gonna need to spin them up inside a silo, inside an actor system. Um, and the way that that works, and I'm gonna start with Orleans now, um, the way that that works from the outside is we get something called a grain factory. When you instantiate an Orleans client, you have an injectable grain factory that you can use in your ASP.NET controllers or wherever you wanna use it. And that grain factory allows you to call this get grain method. And the get grain method with the interface of our actor, that will actually tell the actor system, to tell the cluster to spin up one of these actors. And with Orleans, we have to give it an ID. Because the ID of uh, any actor, like ACA.NET actors don't have to have an ID, you can do whatever you want. Um, but this needs it because that's gonna determine the sharding in the cluster, right? And it's also gonna make sure that when the actor gets recreated, it, it fetches the right data. And what we're gonna get back um, we, after that, we get a grain back and we can call the async methods on, um, on that grain that we get back. But we never hold the reference to the actual grain. What you're getting back from this grain factory is a proxy that is, allowed to, that is able to talk to the actual grain somewhere on the cluster, right? That's the way that works. And when we hit that async here, that's basically the thread not pausing in the async on your method on your actor. No, it's actually your local thread pausing while the network round trip to your, um, to your grain is happening and you getting a response back, right? So that's why these methods need to be task-based so that this can all work um, the way that we want it to work. And the return types that we're actually getting from those methods is actually the stuff that we're gonna get back um, when we execute this on the client side, right? Very straightforward, not hard to do. In ACA.NET, it looks a little bit differently. When we are creating um, actors, we're gonna need to tell the actor system um, how it needs to be instantiated, which constructor parameters we need to pass and we do it with something called props. And the best way to explain props is saying it's a constructor pointer. So it tells us which constructor to use with which parameters on a certain class to spin up an actor. So we first create those props um, with a props.create um, factory method. And what we can then do, these, this is just a params array of um, objects, so you can pass whatever uh, constructor parameters you need. And then you're gonna tell the actor system to create that actor for you. And same here, we're not getting back a reference to the actual actor, we're getting back an iActorRef. And iActorRef is a really powerful thing. It's an object, it's the same, the same way, uh, it works the same way as the one in the grains, the proxy. Um, this is serializer, uh, serializable and you can pass it around your network and it'll, it'll keep working, uh, which is extremely powerful in a lot of things that you do. And now we are doing it asynchronously. Um, so we have a tell, and tell is just sending a message to the inbox of that actor. There is a synchronous method. You could also do the um, fire and forget thing with Orleans actors. Um, here we have something similar as the Orleans way is doing an ask. And basically all that does is it's sending a message to the inbox and waiting for a particular message to come back. So the coding on the actor side remains the same as you've seen in the previous round, but this is like the synchronous way. Now in the American army, they have ask, don't tell. When you're doing ACA.NET, you should be thinking about tell, don't ask. 
Like this is kind of like an anti-pattern. You don't want to be using this with Echo.net unless in certain scenarios you're talking to actors from the outside and you're going to want to wait for a response. But inside your actor system, this is really like a pattern you should steer away from. So that's how that works. Um, so, how would you prefer to create your actors? We can have a factory with interfaces and proxies and async methods, which is really easy to do and very .NET like. And on Aka.NET, you're gonna need to do props, and you're gonna have actor refs, and you can do tells, and you can do asks. Interesting. It means that I, until now, whichever I put first is the one you preferred. We have more rounds. I swapped them around on purpose to not be biased. Okay, let's see what happens on the next round. I'm gonna start with Ake again. Um, as I said, um, actors need organizing and they need sharding, especially if you're using a cluster. And there are some subtle differences between the two frameworks there. Now, if you look at Echo.net, um, actors live in a tree, in a hierarchy, right? There's three that we get for free whenever we spin up an actor system. It's the root, the user, and the uh, system actor. And everything that you create, like we saw in the previous round, if you do actor system dot actor off, what you're creating is a top level actor. Now these actors, they can create children, right? Um, so these parents, they can have children and your um, identifier in an actor system is defined by your place in the tree. So the one at the bottom right is called slash user slash a2 slash b3, right? And that address needs to be unique. Um, so you're gonna have to, um, if you don't give them names, I don't know, we'll take care of it for you, uh, but sometimes you want to address your actors uh, by their address, so you're gonna have to make sure that then you generate them in a unique way. Now, when, um, when we do these, these top level actors, what you've seen um, in the previous round is, is we make props and then create the actor through that. <laughs> If you create a child, it is very similar. It's the code in the bottom. The only thing is different is, that is different is instead of actor system, we are using context. And if you use context actor f of what you're doing is creating a child actor for your current actor. Now, when we start clustering these nodes together, each one of them has their own actors, and we can have an a um, an a two b three. In, on every node, if we so wish, because that will not conflict, because the full address of an actor is defined by the node and um, their place in the hierarchy. But if we want to start to implement sharding, we have full control. We can distribute our shards the way that we want to. There is an aka.cluster.sharding package that provides an abstraction on top of um, these, these clusters, but basically what you do when you implement an Aka.NET cluster is you have a bunch of actor systems that are able to talk to each other. So as soon as you set up clustering, all you do is you create a, um, a ring of um, nodes that are talking to each other, but where your actors go, you can basically have full control over that. There's a whole ways of doing it, um, if you don't want to go for the sharding package, you could build something called routers, where you could use a hash that is computed on a certain message to go to a certain node. And if you then have a mechanism that spins up your actor on that node, that is your sharding mechanism. So you can do a lot, you can do a lot of different things. Also, in an Arca.net cluster, every node can have a certain role. And depending on what actors you're instantiating, you can choose to not use or use certain roles in your cluster. So you have the full control over that. Now in Orleans, it works a little bit differently. Um, they don't call it an actor system, they call it a silo. Um, and grains live in a silo. And your identity um, for an Orleans grain is your type of grain and then the identifier that you give it, right? We saw the I grain with GUID key. Um, if you, have the same, if you have different GUIDs, like that needs to be unique in your entire cluster. That's also going to determine which node a certain grain goes onto. 
And there's no, no, there's no hierarchy. So it's basically like a bunch of marbles in a bag. You have a silo and you can drop a lot of grains into that and the system will distribute them for you. So in that cluster, unlike the previous one, your IDs need to be unique across the entire cluster and the silos, they are cluster aware. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, the disadvantage is you have no control or very little control which um, silo a grain goes into. But because they are virtual actors and you can use this grain factory everywhere, even inside other grains, um, you don't need to know where the cluster has spun up a certain um, grain. You can use that grain factory to get a reference to the actor that might already be living somewhere. Um, and that makes discovery and addressing a lot easier, right? In ACA.net, what you'll probably be doing is passing the actor reference around your network because that is able to talk to the actual actor instance, whereas here you can use the virtual addressing to make that life um, a little bit easier, right? But both of them are still quite similar on the low level. Um, they both implement some kind of ring communication to do um, cluster discovery and to detect which nodes are going down and all of that. On the low end, like they, they, they function really similar, similarly to one another. So, what structure do you like best? Do you prefer your actors to be in a tree uh, where you have full control over everything, over the sharding, but you have to do everything yourself? Or do you prefer the um, easier, flatter structure um, where your actors need to be uniquely ID'd across your entire... Okay, interesting. We have a switch around here. Okay, two points for Orleans and one for Aka.net. Right. There's not a lot more than 40 people in this room, so let's move on. Now, this is arguably... Um, if you look at the differences between these two frameworks, the way that exceptions are handled is probably what ties a lot of the differences together. You'll see in a minute what I mean. Now, in Orleans, what happens if an exception is thrown inside a grain? Um, as I said, like the input and output parameters of those methods, um, they are wrapped in messages for us. And Orleans behind the scenes adds a capability to send an exception back to the caller, right? So if an exception is thrown in the grain, that exception gets serialized. It's, it gets sent in the response message to the calling thread. It gets deserialized there and it gets rethrown, right? So when you have an exception happening in your grain and you're having this task-based method that goes across the network, you will actually get that um, you will get that reception, uh, exception thrown in your calling thread. The source is going to be different and the call stack is going to be different, but like it, will, it will preserve messages and, and exception types and stuff like that. Right. Um, there's a big advantage to that. It's like a very natural way of doing things if you have been a C-sharp developer for a long time. There's also a big downside. Um, for this mechanism to function properly, you always have to wait for the processing on the grain end to end, right? Because that's when your method will return and then you know that no exceptions happened. Um, which means that if you're doing a long processing talk, also your calling thread will pause for a very long time. So we can just call that uh, handle grain uh, handle complete round on our grain, and we can catch the exception that is coming from the grain in the calling thread, right? Very easy to reason about. All you have to remember is it does get serialized and deserialized, so your call stack is gonna be different. Now in ACA.net, we use a concept called supervision. Um, and supervision, any people here with children? Yeah, okay. If your children misbehave in a supermarket, who is responsible? Yeah, right, I have three kids and they have my energy, so I'm responsible a lot. Um, now what happens is errors in ACA.net get escalated to the parent. 
because we have this asynchronous tell, right? We're dumping the message in the inbox of the actor and our calling thread is moving on. It's not waiting for the actor to finish the processing. We cannot escalate exceptions back to the caller, not in the way that we usually do, right? So the method that is being used inside Aka.net is called supervision and it escalates it to its parent actor and the parent will take a decision. It can either decide itself or further escalate up the tree, that is a technicality. It can basically do a couple of things. It can say resume. It's like your, exceptions, your exception wasn't so bad. Um, you can just drop this message and take the next one from your inbox. That's basically what resume does. Stop means it's like, okay, throw away your inbox, um, kill off your actor instance, this exception is bad, it's like, you need to stop. Uh, don't do that to your kids. Um, but this is, this is killing off the actor instance and it throws away the inbox with it. If you restart, you preserve the inbox, but you do recycle the actor instance and you will dispatch the same message again to the new instance, right? So that's the actions you can take. You can either apply it to only the failing child or all of your children, um, which makes sense if you have cut a huge workload into multiple small pieces and the whole thing is invalidated by one exception, right? Now on the parent actor, you will need to do something like this. You need to override the supervisor strategy method and you need to return a strategy that inspects the exception and makes a decision. So you get the exception from your child and your parent can decide what this child actor needs to do, right? If you get a fatal exception. Um, so one for one is only applying it to the failing child. If you get a fatal exception, you might want to stop. If it transients, you want, might want, may want to restart and otherwise, otherwise we're escalating, right? So what do you prefer best for error handling? Are we gonna send it back to the calling thread or, and retro and catch it there? Or are we gonna use a resiliency me mechanism with supervision and community? You can communicate back to the sender with a message if you would like, um, but then you have to do that in the parent and it's not gonna escalate automatically. Okay, we're on 2-2 two, two. Um, and we have 18 minutes left, great. I think I'm on schedule. Um, this ties it all together. Like this supervision, this is what made Ericsson so successful with those telco systems. Because you can build self-healing systems. Anything that fails, you can handle inside the actor system, build your exponential backups if you want, and so on. Now clients. And this is, we are starting with Akka now, okay. Um, you're gonna have a cluster where your sharded actors that are doing the actual work are living, right? At some point, you're gonna want to talk to those actors from the outside, probably sooner than later, right? Um, so in Akka.net, to be able to talk to an actor from the outside, if you have the iActorRef, that works really well. But the only way to get an iActorRef from outside an actor system is to actually create it um, to create an actor in the actor system as a top level actor and get a response from that, right? And then you have an I actor ref. You cannot do that for a node that lives across the network. So the way that you usually talk to actors uh, that live in your cluster is to spin up a client actor system. If you spin up a client actor system and join it to, no, oh, don't do that, okay. And join it to your cluster, um, it can talk to all of the other actors in the cluster and you can hold the reference to your proxy actor that is living in your client actor system. So if you're talking to a bigger cluster from an ASP.NET application, what you're gonna do is spin up a small actor system in that process that is going to be talking to all of your other actors, right? Um, and because of location transparency in the iActor refs, it means you can pass around the iActorRefs that you want and then communicate to the actors directly um, if it need be. Now, Orleans is um, a lot more the way that you're used to. If you spin up, there's an actual Orleans client library that allows you to talk to a cluster 
And that client library gives you an injectable grain factory without actually spin, spinning up an entire actor system. And that allows you to make proxies for actors that get instantiated over um, the cluster. And also your client library is cluster aware. So when it talks to the cluster, if you do an actor off, uh, no, it's not an actor off in uh, Orleans, if you uh, do a get grain um, and it is not already living, it will spin it up on the right node according to the sharding mechanism that it's using. Um, and those proxies, they work the same way that I already showed you. So in the startup code of your application, you're going to use a host builder um, just the same way that you're used to in, in like ASP.NET applications. You're going to use a host builder to build the client. And if you have that host, you can start it and it will contact the cluster, see which nodes there are, and you can start using it. And then that grains factory, um, that is something um, the cluster client is actually al uh, allowing you to do get grain, and that will spin up a grain somewhere on the cluster. If it's already there, it will give you a proxy that is able to talk to it, right? So they had more of a vision around like what clients should look like, and that is more in line with the rest of um, .NET as a language, right? So I think I talk, talked about all of that. Yeah, this service you can inject into your um, DI controller and use that. So, what did you like best? An client actor system that needs to join the cluster where you can spin up your proxy actors and talk to the other nodes in the cluster, or um, a full-fledged client library that is able to work in the same way that a lot of other clients are. Okay, Orleans is one ahead, it's tree two. And then persistence. I've been talking about actors for 45 minutes now, and I haven't mentioned how data gets there. I mean, we can spin up an actor and send it messages and mutate state, but at some point, like the actor or the process is gonna spin down, and it might come up after we restart it, and the data is going to be lost because it's all fields inside an object. It's going to be gone, was in memory. So at some point, we're going to want to write that to a database. Right. Now, the way that Orleans does that is by um, using a state object. And you can design your own. It just needs to be serializable. That's it. Um, and you can design your own and put any number of fields or content into it, all the relevant state of your, um, of your grain should be in there. You can have multiple gray, um, state objects um, per grain, if you would so please. Uh, what you need to do is add them with the persistent state attribute to your uh, constructor of your grain. And that will tell Orleans to inject the correct state management object for this grain into the grain. Um, it's an I persistent state, um, and the way that we can write it to an underlying storage technology is by calling the state write, the, the write state a sync. Um, and this persists the entire object, right? The way that that works is it persists the entire thing. So next time, this actor with the same ID, remember we were using um, something with a GUID key or with an integer key, it's going to use that key to re-query the state store to rehydrate this actor when it spins up again so that your state object is populated when the actor comes back on. And especially in your Orleans, Orleans takes a lot of decisions about spinning down actors and, and bringing them back up, up. So if that happens, it's fully transparent. It'll be as if it was alive the whole time. Right? That is the way that that works in Orleans. And you can use a number of different persistence mechanisms. Um, you can use Azure Blob Store or Table Store or a relational database or a document database. Like there's a whole bunch of plugins that you can use with that. Very similar to ACA.NET. It also supports a bunch of different um, storage technologies. But in ACA.NET, it works a little bit differently. We start by inheriting from one of the persistent actor base classes, which come in the um, Aka.persistence package, 
And the way that it works is, is more of an event sourced persistence model. We now get, um, it needs a persistence ID. As I said, Aka.net actors don't need a key, but when we need to rehydrate actors when they have been down and they come back up, we need an ID to query the data store. And in Aka.net, you do that by implementing the persistence ID uh, property. Um, that needs to be unique across your cluster. Very important. And now we don't have a receive um, register any, uh, registry anymore. We have command and recover. Command is what is coming from the inbox and recover is what's coming from the persistence mechanism when the actor is restarted. So when we are getting recover messages, we don't want to re-persist them because that will be a loop. Um, but if you call the persist method with the message, that is what is going to get written to your data store and the handle method is going to call, be called and that is going to mutate your state in your actor, right? And when this comes back up, um, it will actually first see if there's a snapshot and recover the snapshot. Then it will get all the messages that, were, ha that have happened since the snapshot. We'll bring all of those up, we'll replay those, and then it will start accepting messages from the inbox. Um, so all of that maps really well if you're doing any kind of event sourced stuff, uh, because this is event sourced by nature, right? Um, so these are two different approaches, but basically what they both do is make sure that we can recover state when actors come back up after they have been down, right? So, which persistence model do you like? Oh, we have event sourcing fans here. It maps really well if you build like a DDD type system or a CQRS style system with actors. This persistence model is going to help you tremendously. Um, we're at 3.3. So it might all come down to this one. Um, configuration. Um, when we bring up processes, um, we need to tell them how to communicate to other nodes in the cluster and how all of that is going to work. Um, and what we see in ACA.NET, this has come over from the JVM implementation of ACA. Of ACA. It's called HOCOM, Human Optimized Configuration Object Notation. Um, yeah, it's a mouthful. Um, it looks like JSON, but it's not. It's not JSON compatible. Um, you can have this in files, it parses to um, a structure, and you can apply configurations on top of other configurations to come to like a final one. Um, it's very flexible, but there's almost no syntax highlighting for it, so it's not the most fun to work with. But this is the way you configure actor systems. You configure your persistence in here, you can configure your clustering and your networking. Stay awake, stay awake. Um, and you can do all of that. And at the bottom, you can see where the seed nodes are. That are the nodes that it already knows about when it's joining a cluster, stuff like that, right? Now, in our lanes, we have to input the same kind of information, but in a different way. And again, here you see the host builder again. When we spin up a silo that needs to join a cluster and that needs to have persistence and whatever, uh, it works with this host builder um, with... Um, all the methods that we can call on that to add storage, um, add persistence for timers, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, it's different, but which did you like? Yeah, I figured that that would go that way. Um, that's okay, Orleans is ahead. We have one last thing that I want to show you before we wrap things up, and that is about performance. Um, I did a little bit of benchmarking. Um, I did bench, uh, nbench on my laptop. Um, the amount of messages that I could dispatch to actors on Aka.net was 10 million a second. In Orleans, it was 5,000 seconds. Now you might think that that is a huge difference. 
Um, and the big reason that in my benchmarks this was different is be because ACA.NET was not serializing and deserializing the messages and Orleans was. And I left, I could have worked around that, but it's something that I want to put in here uh, so that you realize it's like, um, this is one of the big performance differences between the two. In Orleans, your messages will get serialized and, and deserialized a lot quicker when you talk to ad other actors. Whereas in ACA.NET, if you pass it around between actors on the same node, um, you're actually passing around the object reference, which is super fast, right? And that attributes for a lot of this. Um, if I would have like, made it more fair and, and forced serialization and deserialization in the ACA.NET one, I think it would still have been faster, but not by this much, right? Also, memory usage. Um, if I created a million actors on my laptop, um, that took 900 megabytes, which means that the overhead for a single actor in a release build is about 900 bytes. So having a couple of million on a single node is not gonna hurt you that much. And it took 11 seconds to do. In Orleans, it took twice as long and it took twice the memory. Now that may seem bad, um, but what you get back in Orleans is a lot of sensible defaults that have been decided for you, right? But you're sacrificing some performance for it. And if you want to have like the last bit of performance out of your actors and your actor systems, you're gonna have more knobs to turn and more things you can do in ACA.NET than you can in Orleans. So I'm not gonna let you vote, I'm gonna give this point to ACA. <laughs> Shit, I have a problem now. Um, because my conclusion was going to be today's winner, but it's a tie, so I'm gonna skip. I, I had two slides for, for both of them, so I'm gonna just skip them. And, um, no, I'm not gonna skip it. I'm first gonna, I'm gonna, I want your opinion. Um, I've always been opinionated on Aka because it's the one that I'm most familiar with. Um, I wanted to take that out of today's talk, which is why I let you vote. I want your opinion, like have I been fair towards Orleans or not? Um, did you feel my preference throughout this talk? Um, okay, that's good. That's great, because that's what I wanted to achieve. That's why I did the voting, um, because I am opinionated, but I didn't want my opinion to be your opinion. I want to show how these things are different because, different, because I think they're both really great. And if, if you ask me for my take, and which is why I'm giving it completely at the end, um, with ACA.NET, you have full control over a lot of things, over your sharding, your messages, your actor life cycles, yeah, like you can turn all the knobs, which means you can squeeze every last bit of performance from this if you want. But a lot of the stuff because of that is way more explicit in the code. You will see the full message contracts. You will have to deal with um, sending messages back to a sender and all of that because all of it is built for performance. But you will get that performance if you go through the learning curve. And which is where Orleans comes in. It's a very opinionated implementation of the actor model. Um, and you have to take my opinion with a grain of salt, but I think that this works really well in a lot of cases. And the performance numbers that I just showed you, it looks really drastic. In a real life scenario, I don't think it will matter that much. So if you want to get up to speed really quickly with doing a distributed, um, a distributed system that you can easily scale out, even Orleans is going to get you ways further than uh, API calls between microservices will get you. And the abstractions that Orleans made are very sensible in a lot of scenarios. Um, I felt very little friction when I was working with it. It was easy to understand. It was very easy to get up to speed with. And it's a lot closer to the C-sharp that you might be used to when you're doing ASP.NET applications, for instance. Um, so don't steer away from Orleans because of the performance numbers or because of my personal preference. I think it's a great framework as well. Um, I think both of these have a place. 
to me, it feels like Microsoft is going to invest in Orleans a lot in the coming years. They're, they've been giving it um, the time of day again. They have been quiet about it for five or six years after they released it um, in 2015. But now with .NET 7, they're actually promoted, promoting it as a distributed programming model in .NET applications. So we're going to see a lot of it. And I think that's exciting because I think we should do more actor-based development whenever we have stateful, high-scale stuff that we need to do. High, like stateful, concurrent stuff. This is a programming model that is going to help you a lot. It doesn't matter which one of the two you use. They will work fine in a lot of situations. I'm Hannes. I'm the head of learning and development at Access in Belgium. Some of my colleagues are here in the front row. That's my Twitter handle and my ICQ number. I've been trying for four years to make ICQ great again. Um, over four years, three people have messaged me on the ICQ app. Yes, they have an app. Yes, it is being maintained. Yes, it still works. And you can activate your old ICQ numbers. Um, that was my story right on time. I'm not sure if we are allowed to take some questions before we get coffee. I'll tell you this, if you want to walk out and grab coffee, like walk out, otherwise come up and um, ask the questions over here while I pack up my laptop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.